I'm Alec Wright, and I'm here today to present uh, our paper, Gray Box Modeling of Dynamic Range Compression, which I uh, wrote with my uh, PhD supervisor, Professor Valimaki, and we're both at the uh, Alto Acoustics Laboratory in Finland. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to give an outline of the talk, so I'm going to do a brief introduction, although we've already heard a bit about compressors today. So. <laughs> Uh, and then I'm going to introduce my proposed, uh, our proposed model. Um, I'm going to talk about how this model can be trained to an emulate an analog compressor. And I'm going to uh, share some results. Okay, firstly, introduction. Uh, so I guess we've kind of seen this already, but dynamic range compression uh, basically involves applying some kind of time varying gain envelope to a signal. Um, and you might use it to, for example, uh, reduce the quiet parts of a, reduce the loud parts of a signal and uh, leave the quiet parts like relatively unaltered. Uh, that's kind of typically why you need it. And um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, analog and, and digital dynamic range compression uh, software and, and uh, devices out there. Uh, and one kind of common theme is usually have this kind of side chain which is going to calculate uh, which is going to be used, it's going to take the input signal and use it to calculate uh, this gain envelope, um, which is then going to be applied to the signal before uh, finally some makeup gain uh, might be applied. Uh, and so just a bit about the modeling technique, uh, like the paper title says, I, I would describe this as a gray box modeling technique. Uh, so as we know, white box modeling, uh, we are directly uh, simulating device behavior through, say, circuit modeling using circuit schematics and stuff like that. And in black box modeling, uh, we can just treat it like a black box and just directly simulate the uh, input-output relationship. Or uh, we can do gray box modeling, where we kind of use some knowledge that we have about the system um, to derive a model, which we then fit uh, using data. So uh, with that, uh, I will introduce uh, the model that we have proposed here. Um, it probably looks kind of familiar, because it's basically like a digital dynamic range compression algorithm uh, from uh, a paper from uh, Queen Mary's in 2012. It was uh, described in this paper. Uh, yeah, and I'll just go through the components quickly now. So the input signal goes to a side chain where it's converted into the log domain, and then it will go into the static gain computer. So essentially, this is just a uh, input-output characteristic um, parameterized by these uh, parameters, uh, threshold, uh, ratio, and knee width. Um, and yeah, so this is just a memoryless uh, function which uh, maps the input gain. And if the input gain exceeds the threshold, it's going to uh, tell the compressor to, to lower the gain. Um, and yeah, so in our model, uh, we could just have a fixed uh, gain curve. Or for example, if we want to include uh, conditioning parameter values, such as like user controls on the device, uh, we can use some kind of hyperconditioning uh, MLP, uh, which will then map the uh, conditioning data to the parameters. Um, and we just used a simple uh, two hidden layer MLP with a tanch activation function uh, for this work. Uh, we didn't explore really much uh, alternatives, because it doesn't need to be evaluated very often, so it uh, doesn't have to be that cheap. Um, OK, so after the static gain computer, you have this uh, gain characteristic curve. Uh, the one in blue is what we get out of the static gain computer, um, which you notice is really you know, jagged and, and spiky. And so we, we don't want to apply that to our signal straight away. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make it sound really bad, so we apply smoothing through this uh, level detector block, um, which we're implementing just as a one-pole filter. Uh, so yeah, it's going to produce a smooth gain envelope. Um, we parameterize this one-pole filter with a time constant tau. Um, you can calculate the uh, corresponding filter parameter alpha uh, using this formula. So this ensures that the uh, filter stability is, um, this ensures the filter stability uh, using this parameterization. And uh, yeah, you can just see the difference equation and, and the step response uh, plotted there. OK, so um, this filter, um, because it's a, it is an IAR filter, but you can also approximate it uh, 
easily as an FIR filter, um, which is useful for training uh, on GPUs, for example. Um, but what you might want to have is a one pole filter with independent attack and release times, so that uh, the behavior can vary uh, depending on whether you're in the attack or release phase. So uh, we've also included this uh, one pole filter with independent attack and release times. So uh, this seems more realistic to uh, what you actually get in, in analog devices. And also, it's just nice to have that control. Uh, people usually want independent attack and release times. So uh, we included that. But that now means that the uh, I couldn't figure out a way to do this uh, without doing a recursive filter, basically. So it kind of slows down the training a bit. I couldn't figure out how to you know, do this in parallel, basically. Uh, so it's a, bit, it's a lot slower than, uh, than using the FIR approximation uh, of the single one pole filter, but it still works. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, and so, yes, now we have our gain curve, um, which is ready to be applied to the output signal. And then the uh, signal will finally go through this makeup gain phase. Um, so, usually, a makeup gain in a digital dynamic range compressor would be uh, just a static gain, uh, for example. However, you know, often in a, in a real analog compressor, for example, you would probably have, well, you, you can't really do that. So you would have something like a uh, makeup gain tube amplifier or something like that. So, so what we propose um, to try out is to replace this makeup gain uh, with a small recurrent uh, neural network uh, based on a previous model that we've used for guitar amplifier modeling. So, so now there's a little black box at the end of the uh, model. Uh, but it's, whoop, it's really little. It just has a single layer GRU. It's got a hidden size of four. Uh, so it's not too expensive. Uh, OK. So now I will talk about uh, training this model. So. This has just been implemented in PyTorch and trained using stochastic gradient descent. Um, we tried two time domain loss functions. Firstly, this error to signal ratio, which is a squared error divided by the signal energy. I point out that this, I think, was quite important because when the uh, compression is very strong, uh, there is low signal energy. So using this ESR then normalizes that uh, so uh, you don't get a model which just kind of ignores the the high, uh, high compression parts of the signal. Um, we also tried this uh, multi-resolution short time energy loss. Uh, and this is simply uh, calculated by dividing the signal into short overlapping frames. Um, and the loss will then just compare the energy in the output and the target frames. Uh, and we did it at multiple resolutions, uh, as seems to be the trend. And uh, yeah, with different frame sizes and and hop sizes. And the idea here was just that uh, you know, it doesn't require such strict uh, time alignment, time domain alignment of the input and the tar uh, output of the model and the target. Um, yes, and for training, we uh, split the data into two and a half second segments, and we carried out parameter updates uh, every 8,000 samples or so uh, to train the model. OK. So, to validate this model, we, uh, we, we trained a model of this uh, Teletronics LA-2A compressor, which is also an optical compressor. Uh, we used a data set that somebody else made. Uh, this was released in 2019 uh, from Signal Train, uh, reference at the end. Uh, and basically, yeah, uh, it, it has this peak reduction knob, which uh, affects how much uh, compression is applied. Um, in the full data set, there is a uh, it, the peak reduction knob has varied from 0 to 100 in steps of 5. Uh, we just used a subset of this, uh, so 0 to 100, but in steps of 10, so kind of leaving out uh, almost half of the data set uh, for the training. Uh, and then the compressed limit switch, uh, which is also on the device, uh, has, has just been left uncompressed for the whole, uh, the whole model. OK, so in this case, uh, we simply are feeding a peak reduction, a single parameter, uh, describing the peak reduction to the uh, hyperconditioning MLP, and that's going to uh, predict a gain characteristic for the static gain curve. Okay, I can now share some results. Uh, so, for a baseline, uh, we use this uh, GRU black box model, uh, which is actually the same as the model that we're using for the makeup gain, uh, except bigger. 
Um, so this has actually also been a, uh, applied in this Steinmetz paper that was, that was mentioned earlier as a, as a baseline uh, for modeling this exact same compressor. Um, so yeah, we just use it as a baseline uh, to see how uh, our proposed model uh, stacks up. So yes, firstly, uh, we have a model here which was trained, uh, which has a static makeup gain. So there's no GRU at the output. So it's been trained with this uh, multi-resolution short-term energy loss. Uh, you can see um, in terms of the ESR loss, it, it does a lot worse than the baseline model. Um, but for this, uh, which makes sense, it wasn't trained for that. Uh, but when compared on this uh, short-term energy loss, it, it kind of is a bit more comparable. But yeah, it's clearly uh, not performing as well as the baseline. You can see, though, that at inference time, the number of operations per sample is much, much smaller uh, for this model. Um, and just for interest, you can kind of see here for, for different values of peak reduction, uh, you can see the, the kind of threshold and ratio and width, uh, knee width that it's learned. So as you'd expect, as peak reduction goes up, more, more compression is applied. Um, next, I have this model which has the GRU makeup gain module at the end. Um, so you can see here that the uh, baseline is still outperforming uh, our model, not by a huge amount. Um, and then again, you can see that, uh, say, the model at the bottom there, it's it's got about 10% of the number of operations per sample to, uh, at runtime, so that's nice, and it also has nice uh, user controls that uh, people can use, uh, unlike the baseline model. Um, okay. Uh, you can also see here some examples of the learned attack and release times of the uh, filter. So, yeah, you can see in the case where there's just a single uh, attack and release, a uh, single parameter, it lands quite a short uh, attack and release time. And then when it has the independence, it, it goes for like a quite, quite fast attack and then slower release. Um, OK. Uh, yep, yeah, and then just a visual comparison. So this is just the RMS envelope of the signal. Uh, you have the input, uh, the output of the model in blue, and then uh, the target uh, in, in, red, uh, in orange. So you can kind of see uh, it's, not, it's not perfect by any means, but it's kind of following uh, more or less uh, as we would like. Um, uh, also, we did some kind of extra validation because uh, we wanted to see, uh, I mentioned earlier that we left out a lot of the peak reduction values from the training data set. So here you can see the test loss calculated for those peak reduction values uh, that weren't in the, data set, uh, in the training data set at all. Um, so you can see that, yeah, maybe there's like a slight increase in error sometimes, but it's usually, it seems to generalize pretty well. Um, you can also see that when the peak reduction is very high, the uh, ESR loss also gets very high because, uh, yeah, I think, um, well, it's obviously just much more challenging to, uh, to model that uh, behavior. Um, okay, I have time for a couple of sound examples. So here we go. And then from the compressor, you can kind of hear there's a lot more sustain at the end there. Um, our baseline model. Uh, and we can just do the proposed uh, best model. Um, Okay, and we can just do this quickly. But yeah, it's kind of hard to, uh, to tell in these uh, listening conditions. Uh, there are sound examples, uh, which I'll link to later. On, uh, online. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, we've presented a model of a gray box, a gray box model uh, of a compressor based on a classic uh, digital dynamic range compressor architecture. It has uh, very interpretable user controls and uh, uses much less parameters and has cheaper to run than a black, black box baseline. For future work, uh, yeah, perceptual evaluation uh, would, would be important. It's not that easy, in my opinion, to assess how, how, 
accurate the model is in that term. Um, and yeah, maybe more integration of user controls as we only had uh, the one in, in this case. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Alec. Uh, we have a question here already in the front. You refer to compressor model, which was, I think, presented something like five years ago by uh, Joshua Rice team. And uh, in this case, you have attack release in logarithmic domain. It's good. It's a, for good compressor, it's a good solution. But uh, uh, LA compressor is not like this. So you cannot compare or you will not get a good result if, if uh, attack releases in linear domain. And attack release can be before static engine or after static engine. There are different models. And uh, I, I, I think it doesn't work well if we, if we use wrong model to, to a certain analog compressor. Okay. Yeah, I mean... It's, it's completely different behavior if you have this attack release engine uh, within logarithmic domain mm -hmm. or within linear domain. Okay, yeah. Well, making changes to that architecture would, would be pretty trivial to do. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks. For you, for the future. <laughs> Oh, we have a, a minute. I just wanted to ask real quick, you mentioned it uh, was the last bullet point, uh, extending the model to maybe take into account uh, attack and release parameters. Yes. You got lucky that the LA-2A doesn't have those, right? So you, you picked yeah. the right one. Uh, but I don't know, did you already have a look at uh, any other maybe uh, data set that has? Well, I, I did experiment with a, with a pedal, but it was challenging actually because I felt like uh, the parameters weren't, weren't so well uh, they weren't so independent from each stage of the compressor, you know. So, uh, yeah. Uh, but I, I didn't uh, get very far with that, basically. Do you think maybe just uh, putting them as conditioning with hyper-conditioning, uh, as you did with them, it should work, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the only, the only thing that I would be concerned about is, like, giving too much information to this uh, makeup gain module because you don't want it to, like, start just doing the compression itself because then the model is not very interpretable anymore. Yeah, uh, right. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right. I think there was a question from Sebastian here in front. We have time for one more. Um, could you go back to the peak reduction plot fairly at the end? Uh, j just for me to, for the interpretation. Yeah, exactly that one. So, so the peak reduction, that's the conditioning information. Yes. Right? And, and is this picture kind of telling me that it doesn't make a big difference whether you have it or not? or? Oh, am I interpreting? It's just this saying that this, the red data points, uh, they were peak production values that weren't included in the training data set. Um, and now they've been used to calculate the test loss just to show that it, it generalizes to these values that weren't seen during mm. training, basically. Yeah. Okay, so but if you would leave out the conditioning entirely, that, then this works way, way worse, the whole thing. How, how do you mean leave out the conditioning? Uh, just entirely? not do conditioning. Uh, that you don't have that information. I wouldn't. I mean, you could learn a single parameter control, I guess. But mm, okay, maybe there is some more basic confusion on my side. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. We need to move on. Uh, let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you, Alex.